really going to start at the, the really basics of 12 lead EKG G interpretation and the sense of what are we looking at um, and what are we looking for and where are we looking at it and to hopefully getting to imitators with bundle branch blocks and, and left ventricular hypertrophy. So before we jump into the actual 12 lead EKG interpretation, it's extremely important to understand coronary artery anatomy. Um, so your left and your right coronary artery obviously come off the branch of your aorta, uh, or I'm sorry, the base of your aorta. And the, these two coronary arteries are the main arteries that supply the actual myocardium itself with oxygenated blood. Um, they ultimately have several different branches that branch off of them to supply the different areas of the myocardium, but the left main coronary artery and the right main coronary artery are the two um, large main suppliers of uh, the myocardium. So the left coronary artery, it supplies the left ventricle, the interventricular septum, which is that um, thick piece of muscle that separates your right and your left ventricle, part of the right ventricle and the heart's conduction system. So our SA node, our AV node, AV junction, the bundle of his, our bundle branches and our Purkinje fibers, it's really what helps perfuse that electrical system. There's two main branches of the um, left coronary artery. So uh, the first major branch is this left anterior descending. Okay, and here's my left coronary artery coming off of the base of the aorta. And this main artery coming down the anterior side of the left ventricle, that is my left anterior descending, which if you think about it, it's pretty easy to keep that straight because it's coming off of our left coronary artery and it is going down. So it is our left anterior descending or artery. That is the branch off of the left coronary artery. The other major branch of the left coronary artery is the circumflex. And you can kind of see it here um, branching off um, near the top of that left coronary artery or the left main coronary artery. And that circumflex actually wraps around to the posterior side of that left ventricle. Trying to get us to advance there. There we go. So the right coronary artery, it supplies portion of the right atrium, portion of the right ventricle, the posterior and the inferior side of the right ventricle and part of the conduction system. There's two major branches of the right coronary artery that we need to be familiar with. There's the posterior descending artery and there's a marginal branch. Um, and just to kind of highlight those real quick, we have our right coronary artery Right, I'm writing in blue. It comes off the base of our aorta. As that right coronary artery travels down, you can see right in here, it branches off. Part of it wraps around to the posterior portion of the heart, and the other branch comes, continues down and goes down um, the anterior side of the heart, but over here to where our right ventricle would be, okay? So the posterior descending artery, this is the portion that wraps around um, to the posterior side of the heart, appropriately named. And we see this wrapping around um, here under our right atrium and continuing down the posterior side of um, the, the heart and the right ventricle. So not only is it important to understand coronary anatomy as it applies to the 12 lead EKG, um, but, but you all will see test questions on this. I can almost guarantee you'll see test questions on coronary artery anatomy, not only in your program, but also on the National Registry. Um, and you know, and what those questions could potentially look like is you're given a 12 lead EKG and you're not being asked to identify whether it is an anterior wall of MI or a septal wall of MI or an inferior wall of MI. Rather, you're being asked to identify which coronary artery is most likely affected to give you that type of MI on the 12 lead EKG that you have in front of you. So keep that in mind. Coronary artery anatomy is kind of difficult to, to remember uh, as you progress through the paramedic program, but um, there's definitely going to be um, 
several areas where you see it pop up in testing and that you're expected to know what part, portion of the heart correlates with which coronary artery. So lead placement. Um, limb leads must be placed on the limbs, right? And there's some exceptions to that. We can move higher up on the limbs um, or maybe even the lower trunk uh, or the abdominal cavity. But truly, limb leads are called limb leads for a reason. They should be placed on the limbs. And that's because that is what gives us the best view of the myocardium when we're looking for a STEMI or to rule out a STEMI. Not gonna spend too much time on that. Chest lead placement or precordial lead placement. Remember your precordial leads, that's just another term for chest leads. So we might use that interchangeably today. V1 goes to the, is it the fourth intercostal space to the right of the sternum. V2 is at the fourth intercostal space to the left of the sternum. We are then actually gonna to go to V4. V4 goes in the fifth intercostal space at the left midclavicular line. And then we're gonna place V3 directly between leads V2 and V4. And then V5 and V6, they should all be on the same plane or at the same level as V4. So V5, it, is at the left anterior axillary line, and V6 is level with V5 still, um, but it's at the mid axillary line. So V4, V5, and V6, they should all be on the same plane. They should all be on the same level. Um, and I think if you pay attention to how 12 lead EKGs are done, not only in the, in the pre-hospital setting, but also the clinical setting, you'll see some pretty significant varieties with chest lead placement. But you know, start a good habit early in your career. That way you can, you can place 12 lead EKGs appropriately um, because obviously all of these electrodes are being placed in a particular area for a reason. So global negativity. So the, this slide and the next slide, I'm gonna talk about what, is, what are some things that we can kind of check to make sure that we have a good 12 lead EKG. And I don't mean a good 12 lead EKG in the sense of a clinical status, but more so in, okay, um, I have appropriate placement and the things that I'm seeing on this 12 lead should therefore be valid because I have good limb lead placement. So um, global negativity is if you look at the 12 lead EKG strip and if you have um, if all of your leads, lead one, lead two, lead three, if all of those are deflected downwards, then your, your upper limb leads are probably switched. You probably have your right arm lead on the left arm and vice versa. So that's something that, that's good to look at. So look at lead one. If it is deflected down, and I mean the QRS complex, if the QRS complex and lead one on your 12 lead is deflected negatively, it probably means that you have your left and your right switched, okay? And I have done that, right? What we all do, 2 and 3 a.m., 12 leads, um, and I have done that. And fortunately, I was able to catch it because when you do enough 12 lead EKGs, it just kind of stands out um, when things are going different directions than what they should be. Um, but it's always a good idea to look at lead one. It should be pointing up. The lead right next to it, AVR, should always be pointing down. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the strips. And then we have R wave progression. So this is kind of another good thing to look at just to make sure that your leads are on appropriately, they're placed correctly. So if you go to your precordial leads, remember your chest leads, V1 through V6, we should have a good progression from negative and V1, so negative deflection in V1, to a positive deflection in V6. So if I start here in V1, and as I work my way down through these leads, you can see that my QRS complexes slowly have a progression from entirely negative, like we see in V1, to entirely positive, like we do in V6. So that's called R-wave progression. And um, that's just another tool that you can kind of have to make sure that your limb leads are placed appropriately and that they're not switched. You don't have your, your left leg lead put on the right leg, vice versa. You don't have your um, right arm lead placed on the left arm lead.
So what are our goals when we're looking at a 12 lead ECG and we're looking at a 12 lead, what are our actual goals? So our goals are to recognize and localize that acute myocardial infarction on the ECG. And we also have to understand that associated coronary artery um, anatomy. And do we expect that this 12 or that this um, myocardial infarction is going to spread to other areas? Um, do we suspect that the patient's going to become bradycardic or tachycardic based on the findings that we're seeing, based on the areas that we're seeing are injured or infarcted? So a normal 12-lead ECG does not rule out an acute myocardial infarction. And, and I hope if you learn nothing more in this lecture, I hope you learn that. Um, I, I cringed when I was on the medic unit and I would hear my partner say, um, well, sir, we did a 12-lead EKG and everything looks great. You're not having a heart attack, right? Because we don't know that. He may not be having the specific type of MI or heart attack that we're trained to look for on 12-lead EKG. Um, but there is a such thing as a non-STEMI, and um, they happen about 50% of the time. So when there's a heart attack, 50% of the time it is a STEMI, and 50% of the time it is a non-STEMI. So just because we do a 12-lead EKG and it comes back with no ST segment elevation, that does not mean that you and your patient are in the clear, okay? So what my advice to you is, is sir, we did a 12-lead EKG from the test that we can run, we can rule out the type of heart attack that we're trained to look for. However, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily out of the woods yet, right? You can still be having an MI. We've got to get you to the hospital. They need to do blood work before we can totally rule this thing in or out. So just kind of becoming familiar with the anatomy of a 12-lead EKG. So and I'm not talking about coronary anatomy, but really the layout. Um, there's, there's several different variances of this, you know, depending on if you're printing it off from an EKG in the clinical setting or an EKG monitor in the clinical setting like we see here. If you're printing off a physio control monitor, if you're printing it off a Zoll monitor or a Philips monitor, all of them look a little bit differently, right? But I think that um, you, you'll kind of get the gist of it after we talk about it. So there's three different parts that are circled here. And I'm gonna start with this top left section first where it says um, March 4th uh, or March 30th of 2004, um, it talks about the patient demographics, and then down below that, it gets into the PR interval, it gets into the QRS duration, um, all of that different data there. So that area there, um, when, when you get in a 12-lead EKG printout, and you have actual data to go off of and actual measurements to go off of, that is 100% diagnostic. And that is accurate information. That are, those are measurements that the machine took, Okay. That is objective information. To the right of that, where you have the machine's interpretation, my advice is, to you is do not get comfortable reading that and using that to dictate what type of heart attack this patient's having or if the patient's having a heart attack. Um, there's been multiple studies done out there on um, the accuracy of that reading or of that measurement or of that printout. And, and Adam, if, if I think you're probably familiar with this study, um, and, and feel free to chime in if I, if I get this incorrect, but when um, that prints out and says there is an acute MI suspected, okay, and we see that terminology like on the physio control, the LifePak 12, the LifePak 15 printouts, when it says acute MI suspected, there is an MI, okay? You can be pretty sure that there is a STEMI somewhere on that paper. When it prints out and says, normal sinus, no ST change noted, whatever, no acute MI suspected, there is a very high percentage and very high likelihood that that is incorrect information, okay? So the monitors are very good at saying, when there's a STEMI, you know, and they tell you there's a STEMI, it's probably a STEMI. But do not get used to falling back on that information because there have been multiple studies done that says when it tells you it's a good 12 lead EKG, it's normal findings, there's nothing to be alerted about, it's probably wrong, okay? So just keep that in the back of your mind as you're a practicing paramedic in the back of the medic unit. And then down at the bottom, um, you, these are just our continuous leads that we see that we can use for rhythm interpretation and rhythm identification. Those can be changed from monitor for monitor. It's, it's truly whoever's at your agency and responsible for the cardiac monitors, they can pick and choose 
which leads that we get that full six second strip on at the bottom of the 12 lead EKG. All right, so now let's talk about um, ST segment elevation and ST segment identification. So before we can find the ST segment, we have to be able to find the J point. And the J point, ironically enough, is the junction between the end of the QRS complex and the beginning of the ST segment. So remember the J point is the junction of where that QRS complex is ending and that ST segment is beginning. So every time you measure the QRS complex for its width, right, to determine is it narrow or normal or wide, is it greater than 0.12 or is it less than 0.12, Every time you measure that QRS complex, you're finding the J point. It's at the end of the QRS complex. We have to be able to find that so that we can identify what is our ST segment so that we can then make the determination, is it elevated, is it even with the isoelectric line, or do we have some depression? The ST segment itself is the area between the S wave, which is the end of the QRS, and the T wave. So it should be a somewhat flat isoelectric line. Um, that's that time between our ventricular depolarization that we see in our QRS complex and our ventricular repolarization of what we see in our T wave. So that ST segment is what we're actually looking at to be able to determine is it elevated, which would be a STEMI, is it even with the isoelectric line, or is it actually a little bit depressed telling me that I have some ischemia. So, what we are doing is we are identifying the J point so that we can see the beginning of our ST segment and we are comparing that ST segment's height to the preceding TP segment, okay? So find your ST segment and then look at that TP segment right next to it, right down the line, right on the other side of the T wave you're going to use those two lines or those two landmarks to make your determination, is this patient having a STEMI or not? Is your ST segment elevated above the TP segment or is it depressed below the TP segment or is it essentially at the same level as the TP segment? So make sure that you know that. And I find a lot of paramedic students who don't know that and they just kind of look broadly across the strip to say, yeah, it looks tall to me. It looks a little bit elevated. But if you don't actually know what you're comparing it to, it's difficult to make that determination of, yep, this is elevated by two millimeters, or it's elevated by three millimeters, or it's not elevated at all. So we're comparing the ST segment to the preceding TP segment in terms of the height comparison. Hey, Brandon. Sure. Yep. Can you go back for just a, a second there? Just terminology purposes, I want to make sure they understand you're saying preceding, it would actually be the next, the following. Oh, I, I'm sorry, yes. So I just want to make sure that they're clear on that, that when Brandon's looking at that J point in the S segment, he is comparing it to the TP segment to the right, not the one before it. Correct. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, I knew what you meant, but I just wanted to clear that up. All right, so let's um, take a few minutes and, and look to make sure that we can all find the J point so that we can all find the ST segment and we can make a determination. Is it elevated? Is it even with the isoelectric line or, or is it even a little bit depressed? So uh, let's look at this first one here. Let's do this. Okay, so let's look at number one. So I want you all to find the J point. And I know it's hard to, to do on your computer screen. And I know it's hard to kind of make a mental note of where it's at. But I'm gonna give you a few seconds to find the J point and then I'm going to highlight um, where it would be. So the J point for number one will be about right there. Okay, right where I have that red circle. And again, it's a little bit hard to place it exactly where it's at, right? And the red circle is a little bit larger um, so that you all can actually see it, but hopefully you kind of get the gist of it there. So that would be about where my QRS complex ends and my ST segment begins. And then I have to look at the following TP segment to make the determination, is it elevated? 
is it even with or is it below? So if I draw a straight line from that J point, you see that we're pretty even with that following TP segment. So we're isoelectric with it. I don't see any elevation there, which would make me say that I don't see a STEMI or ST segment elevation, I should say, in that one picture. Now we're gonna jump over to number two. Well, right there is my J point. And as I draw a straight line over, there may be a little bit of elevation there. And we haven't talked about how much elevation is elevation to be concerned with, um, but there might be about one millimeter of elevation there, about one small box there. Again, it's kind of hard because I, I drew the line um, pretty wide and pretty thick so that you can actually see it on your screen. The J point for number three, would be where that dot is. As I go a straight line over, I'd say I definitely have ST segment elevation that's greater than one millimeter in height. We drop down to number four. So this is kind of a tricky one. Um, number four, the J point is actually down near the bottom of it. Um, and if we get into imitators tonight, we'll actually kind of talk about what's going on there in number four. Um, it's called an RSR prime configuration, probably a right bundle branch block. We need a lot more information to go off than that, uh, but that's just kind of what that looks like to me, what, how it stands out to me. Um, so remember, we're going off the end of the complex, end of the S wave, okay? And the end, of, that would actually be one entire complex of what we're looking at there. As we bring our line straight over from the J point, we're isoelectric, so there's nothing concerning there. As we jump over to number five, my J point would be where that red dot is. As I draw a straight line off of that, again, I'm basically right on the isoelectric line. And as I jump over to number six, my J point's probably a little bit lower down than, than where that circle is, but not by much. And as I come over, I down, I'm definitely a little bit lower than that um, following TP segment. So I have a little bit of depression there, which could clue me in of, yeah, this patient's having a little bit of ischemia. So hopefully that helps in J-point identification, right? And, and the more that you do 12 lead EKGs, the more comfortable you will become with them and being able to pick these things out. And there's definitely some tricky ones. Number four is a tricky one. Um, but for the most part, once you're able to find the J point and you're able to find the end of that QRS complex, um, you'll, you'll fly through that exercise if you weren't already flying through that exercise as we just did it. I'm sure I have, we probably have people um, with us today that are kind of all, you know, up both ends of the spectrum here. So STEMI or not, um, what are we looking for to actually call something a STEMI? So we're looking for ST segment elevation. I think we've discussed that enough. And we're looking for one millimeter or more of elevation. And one millimeter is one small box on the EKG paper. So not only are we looking for one millimeter of elevation or more, but we're looking for it in two or more anatomically contiguous or numerically consecutive leads. That's the big part here. Everyone knows that a STEMI is an ST segment elevated myocardial infarction, right? So just by the name of it, we can pick up on the fact that the ST segment is elevated in order to be a STEMI. But we also have to remember that it must be elevated in two or more anatomically contiguous or numerically consecutive leads. And we're going to look at what that actually means. So one more thing about um, the actual, some of the findings that we can find on a 12 lead EKG before we jump into, into some practice strips is uh, when we get this message, and this is off a, off a LifePak 12 or a LifePak 15 monitor, it's a physio control strip um, that we're looking at. Um, if you get the message that says, um, cannot rule out anterior infarct, possibly acute, or if we get a message that says, um, 
uh, inferior so wall MI suspected age undetermined. What that's actually telling us when we get that age undetermined message, um, it's actually telling us that it's picking up on pathological Q waves. And those pathological Q waves are Q waves that are greater than 0 0.04 seconds or one small box. So there's physiologic Q waves and those are normal findings, right? If we did a 12 lead EKG on, on any of us, we would probably have physiological Q waves. And those are Q waves that are less than one small box in width or less than 0 0.04 seconds. When we get wide Q waves on a 12 lead EKG, those are called pathological Q waves. And that tells us that this patient has had a previous infarction in that area. So again, if you get a 12 lead EKG strip and it says, you know, anterior wall MI age undetermined or inferior wall MI age undetermined. When we get that language, that is telling us that it is picking up on pathological Q waves. And a lot of times when we see that, we're not able to see those really wide Q waves, um, but that machine was able to measure it. And remember, the machine is really good at taking measurements, like I said a few slides ago. So if you get that message, doesn't mean that they're having a heart attack right now. It's just telling you that they're picking up on some wide pathological Q waves and that they've probably had an MI in that area before. Now, real quick, um, you know, again, we have, we have students kind of from all over the spectrum, I think, in terms of where they're at in their program. Um, there are two types uh, of MIs, right? And I'm not talking about STEMI and non-STEMI, but I'm talking about the level of the myocardium or the depth of the myocardium that's affected. So you have a subendocardial MI and you have a transmural MI. A subendocardial MI is when a partial thickness of that myocardium hasn't been infarcted. So it hasn't made its way through the entire thickness of the myocardium, the entire thickness of that left ventricular wall, only a partial thickness of the left ventricular wall. That is called a subendocardial MI. The transmural MI is a full thickness myocardial infarction. When a patient has a transmural MI, they have that full wall thickness myocardial infarction, that patient will be left with pathological Q waves. Okay, if they have a subendocardial infarction, they may or may not have pathological Q waves on 12 lead EKGs down the line. So if we come up with pathological Q waves in the anterior leads or inferior leads or wherever, that doesn't only tell you that, yep, this patient has had an MI there before, but it also tells you that it was probably transmural in nature, meaning that the entire thickness of that section of the myocardium was actually infarcted. So let's talk about anatomically contiguous leads or numerically consecutive leads. So I said that we're looking for ST segment elevation that is uh, one millimeter in height or greater in two or more anatomically contiguous leads or numerically consecutive leads. So uh, anatomically contiguous leads, we are looking at what are the actual lead groupings of the 12 lead, right? Meaning one AVL, V5, and V6, those are my lateral leads. Two, three, and AVF, my inferior leads. V1 and V2, my septal leads, and V3, V4, my anterior leads. Those are my anatomically contiguous lead groupings, okay? So if I have ST segment elevation in lead two, and I have ST segment elevation in lead three, those are both um, anatomically contiguous. Change this. So let's say I have elevation here, and I have elevation here. Those are anatomically contiguous to one another. They belong to the same lead grouping. So therefore, in that scenario, I would have an inferior wall MI, okay? If I have ST segment elevation in V1 and I have ST segment elevation in V2, those belong to the same grouping anatomically. That is a septal wall MI. And the same with V3 and V4, those are my anterior leads. And I already said one, AVL, V5 and V6, so those are my lateral leads. 
So that is the anatomically contiguous part of that 12 lead EKG interpretation uh, is the lead groupings themselves. So I have to have one millimeter of ST segment elevation and two or more of those anatomically contiguous leads. The other way that I can have it is in numerically consecutive leads. And primarily we look at our precordial leads for this, my chest leads. So numerically consecutive, meaning just the way that we count. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So not necessarily that they're touching one another, okay? Not that they're butting up against one another, but that they're numerically consecutive. So we already said if we had elevation in V1 and V2, that would be a septal wall MI. Those are anatomically contiguous to one another. But let's say I also have elevation in V3, but I don't in V4, I don't in V5, and I don't in V6. So I only have elevation in leads V1, V2, and V3. Well, I know I definitely have a septal wall MI because V1 and V2, they belong together but I also have elevation in V3. So V2 and V3, those are numerically consecutive to one another. When we count, we count one, two, three, four, and so on, right? So if I have elevation in V2 and I also have elevation in V3, that becomes a, a STEMI. So that would become the new name for this with the three leads of elevation would be an anterior septal wall MI. It's a little hard to write on a computer screen, so please forgive me here. So let's go over another scenario real quick. If I have elevation in V4 and I have elevation in V5, but I don't have elevation anywhere else, do I have ST segment elevation in two or more numerically consecutive leads? I do, I have it in V4 and I have it in V5. So this is an anterior lateral wall, am I? Let me throw one more thing at you. Let's say I have elevation in V3 and V6, but I don't have it anywhere else. Is that a STEMI? It is not, okay? They are not numeric, they're, they're next to each other. Don't get that confused. They are next to one another, but they're not numerically consecutive, okay? So just because I have elevation in V3 and I have elevation in V6, that by itself is not a STEMI. If I had elevation in V2 or if I had elevation in V4, then I have something. Or if I had elevation in V5 next to V6, numerically consecutive, then I would have something. But at this point, I only have ST segment elevation in two different leads. Certainly concerning, I want to keep an eye on it to see if it develops and if the leads um, that are numerically consecutive to it um, start to become elevated. So I'm definitely going to keep an eye on it. But in and of itself, just in that scenario, I do not have ST or I do not have a STEMI. So let's look at this real quick. And I'm gonna give you all a few seconds to, to work your way through this. I want you to see if you see any elevation in any of the leads. And if you do, are they anatomically contiguous to one another or are they numerically consecutive to one another? It doesn't mean anything. I'll give you a few seconds. So as you're working your way through this strip, the way that I always look at every single strip is left to right, just like we read, okay? And there's a little bit of a caveat to this, and I think Adam will hit on it near the end, but just for starting purposes so we're all on the same page, the way that I read a 12 lead EKG is I start from the left and I read to the right, okay? So in this scenario, oops, sorry. In this scenario, I start with lead one, okay? It's on my left side. And then I go to AVL, V5, and V6. 
So I'm looking at my lateral leads and I'm only looking at one AVL V5, V6 just because one is my first lead at the top left. So I am looking at this 12 lead EKG and I'm interpreting this 12 lead EKG in, in a systematic approach, but in as a grouping. Okay, I work with a lot of students who look at lead one and then two and then three and then AVL, then AVF, and they work their way up and down through the strip. My problem with that is how do you know by the time you've looked at one, and you look at two, you look at three, and you get to AVL, you kind of already forgot what, what did I have in lead one, right? And AVL and lead one are the, are the two leads that correspond with one another. So when you start with lead one, I encourage you to then go to AVL and then go to V5 and V6 and just knock out your lateral leads altogether, okay? It's much easier to pick up on, on any trends uh, when, when you approach it that way. So as I look in lead one, and we're, we're gonna do a lot of review strips at the end, so it might seem like I'm going through this a little quick, uh, but we're gonna do a lot of review strips at the end. So when I look at lead one, I do not see any ST segment elevation. I see a little bit of a, a flipped T wave or some depression there. When I look at AVL, I definitely have depression and inverted T waves. When I look in V5 and V6, I don't see anything concerning. Next, I'm gonna look at lead two, three, and AVF. So my inferior leads. When I look at lead two, I definitely see some elevation that looks about to be one or two millimeters. Lead three, I see elevation that's probably two or three millimeters in height. So just right there, I have elevation in lead two, I have elevation in lead three. Without even looking at AVF, I know I have an inferior wall in mine because I have elevation in two or more anatomically contiguous leads at this point. I look at lead AVF, I also have elevation there. So yep, I have an inferior wall in mine. I already knew that a lead ago but I definitely have an inferior wall in my. Next, I'm gonna to go to V1 and V2. My septal leads, I don't see any uh, ST segment elevation there. I don't see any ST segment depression. And then finally, I'm gonna to go to my anterior leads, V3 and V4. I don't see any depression there. I don't see any elevation there. So the only thing that I see that's really alarming to me in terms of ST segment elevation at this point <clears throat> excuse me, is elevation in 2, 3, and AVF for my inferior leads. So I know I have an inferior wall in my. But also keep in mind that one of the things we saw as we worked our way through here was inverted T waves and depression in 1 and AVL. Okay? So this is an inferior wall in my with reciprocal changes in my in leads one in AVL. Okay, inferior wall MI with reciprocal changes in lead one in AVL. And we're going to talk about what reciprocal changes are in the next two slides. So when you're talking about reciprocal changes, think about a teeter-totter. Think about on one side of the teeter-totter, you have your inferior leads. You have two, three in AVF. On the other side of the teeter-totter, you have one AVL, V5, and V6, and really all leads on the other side, okay? So you have this teeter-totter. Well, it's common to see when we have, you don't have to see it, but it's common to see when we have elevation and two, three, and AVF, we get depression in our lateral leads. We can get it in all leads, but most commonly, we see them in our lateral leads even more specifically, leads one in AVL. On the flip side of that, when we get elevation in our lateral leads, we can see inversion or flip T waves uh, in our inferior leads, two, three, and AVF, okay? So it's a teeter-totter. As one becomes elevated, the other one is commonly found to be depressed or inverted. Um, and that is with your inferior leads versus mainly your lateral leads, but you can have reciprocal changes in your V leads as well. So why is that? <clears throat> so if you think about, think about looking at the left ventricle or a ventricle or section of your heart, it really doesn't matter. Think about looking at it from one side, 
okay? So let's say that we're looking at it from the left side, which is uh, the inferior side in this picture. So let's say we're looking at it from this side, okay? When I'm looking at it from my inferior leads, let's say I'm getting ST segment elevation. Well, if I'm looking at it from this opposite side, and in this scenario, it's my lateral leads, I'm going to see depression, right? It's kind of a mirrored effect. If I see elevation from this side, if I go around the other side and look at it, well, now it appears to be depressed to me or inverted, okay? And that's essentially what reciprocal changes are. It's just showing you this mirrored effect in other leads across the 12 lead EKG strip. You don't have to have reciprocal changes for that to be an MI. All it is is just kind of extra evidence that, yep, um, we're, we're definitely having an MI in our inferior wall. We have reciprocal changes. So which is telling me my lateral leads are even seeing this thing is inverted. Okay, it's just kind of extra evidence. I don't need it to call it an MI, an MI but it's there. Okay, that's all reciprocal changes are. So remember, inferior leads on one side, and really all other leads on the other side of that teeter-totter, but primarily we see it in our lateral leads just because of where these two um, leads are actually looking at the left ventricle from, what angle they're looking at it from. So if we look at this strip again, uh, I think this might be the, the, the identical strip or it's, it's very similar strip. So looking at reciprocal changes, I have ST seg oops, I have ST segment elevation in leads two, three, and AVF. So I have an inferior wall MI. Okay. If we look in lead one, we look in lead AVL, we have inversion. Okay. Those that is my reciprocal change. I don't have it anywhere else on this strip, and that's fine. I would just say I have an inferior wall of mine with reciprocal changes in my lateral leads. It leads one in AVL. Again, I don't have to have those reciprocal changes in order to call this an MI. It's just kind of extra evidence. Okay. We already caught you red-handed, but we also got video, we also got it on video. Okay. It's just extra evidence to have for the crime that's being committed here. And then I only have a few more slides to cover and I'll turn it over to Adam. There's two types of MI that I wanna talk a little bit more in depth on um, and, and just kind of cover the anatomy and, and why they're and their significance. So an extensive anterior wall MI. So this is when we have ST segment elevation in our septal leads, anterior leads, and our lateral leads. So we have ST segment elevation in V1 through V6, okay? Now remember, it doesn't have to be V1 through V6, but it's at least gotta be V2 through V5 to get that numerically consecutive um, ST segment elevation, right? So that is called an extensive anterior wall MI. Um, and that's also termed, and this is um, you know, pretty consistent across the country from my experience, a widow maker. And the reason that's called the Widowmaker is it has about an 80 to 90% mortality rate associated with it. And when we get an extensive anterior wall MI or ST segment elevation in all of our precordial leads, our septal leads down through our lateral leads, this is telling us that we have a block high in that left main coronary artery. So in this gray arrow is kind of pointing to it. We have a blockage that's high up in that left main coronary artery. So remember, when we have a blockage that is occurring, anywhere that's downstream of that blockage is not getting perfused like it needs to be. It's not getting oxygenated blood flow like it needs to be. So when we get that blockage, everything else that's downstream of that is going to become ischemic, injured, and infarcted. So when we get this ST segment elevation that goes from my septal leads all the way down through my anterior and my lateral leads, that's telling us we have a left main coronary artery occlusion and that is very significant because we are cutting off fusion for really to everything below that, which is my entire left ventricle, which we know is the workhorse and the true pump of our cardiac system. Okay. So this person needs to be opened up and they need to be on the table 10 minutes ago. 
Um, so when we get that extensive anterior wall MI, that significant ST segment elevation, know that pathophysiology of what's actually happening behind that, a clot high up in that left main coronary artery, which is subsequently cutting off blood flow down to that left circumflex and down to that left anterior descending. So, and here's an example of what that would look like. So if we look at this, and obviously I kind of just gave it away, right? I, I told you all what to look for. But when we look at this, do we have any elevation in V1? And eh, I don't think so. There's not, there's nothing there that I would say that I could definitively say, yes, there is elevation in V1. Okay. So I'm going to rule it out. Do I have elevation in V2? Yes. Um, I definitely have elevation in V2. Do I have elevation in V3? Yes. So right there alone, I have an anterior septal wall MI because I have ST segment elevation and two numerically consecutive leads. I'm going to continue looking. Do I have ST segment elevation in V4? Yes. Do I have ST segment elevation in V5? Yes, I do. Do I have it in V6? I don't see any elevation there. So I have ST segment elevation in V2, V3, V4, and V5. That is one septal lead, both anterior leads and one lateral lead that are all numerically consecutive to one another. This would be called an extensive anterior wall MI, also called a Widowmaker. Again, it has about an 80 to 90% mortality rate associated with it because of that huge occlusion in that left main coronary artery cutting off perfusion um, downstream to it, wiping out our left ventricle entirely. And what I'd be willing to bet is because of that huge occlusion in that left main coronary artery, if we take a repeat 12 lead EKG on this patient 5, 10, 15 minutes down the road, we're going to see elevation in V6 and we're probably going to see elevation in V1. Okay, it just hasn't um, extended all the way to the areas that those leads are looking at at this point. An inferior wall MI. So for, from the inferior wall um, it is primarily supplied by the right coronary artery. Um, and there's, there's a, um, I guess, a phenomenon that, that, that we, I won't dive into tonight called coronary artery um, dominance. Some people are right coronary artery dominant and some people are left coronary artery dominant. The majority of the population, about 70 to 80 percent of people are right coronary artery dominant meaning their right coronary artery supplies the majority of um, not only the right ventricle, but also their interventricular septum and their uh, portion of their, their left ventricle as well. So the posterior descending artery, if you remember from going back to, to one of our first slides, that posterior descending artery comes off of our right main. This would be our right main, okay? Our posterior descending comes off and wraps around, conveniently enough, the posterior side of the heart and then travels downwards or descending, okay? It supplies the inferior wall. Our proximal right coronary artery, so this section right here, okay, or our right main, it supplies our right ventricle, our posterior wall, and also a portion of our inferior wall. So our right coronary artery, it has a, some pretty significant workload, um, and especially in our right coronary dominant patients. So I cover that because if we have an inferior wall of mine, I'm sure, you know, depending on where you're at in your program, if you have an inferior wall of mine, hopefully you were taught that once you see that inferior wall of mine, your job's not over yet you need to check for a right ventricular infarction. And the reason we do that is because of that coronary artery anatomy that I just showed you. So remember our right coronary artery supplies a portion of our inferior wall, okay? It also supplies a, uh, our right ventricle. Well, if I'm having an inferior wall MI or an inferior wall infarction, there's a chance that that occlusion is high enough that it's also infarcting my right ventricle. Okay, because ultimately they're supplied by the same vessel. It just depends on the location of that occlusion as to is it just an inferior wall of MI or is it a right ventricular infarction and an inferior wall of MI. So a 
in order to, to appropriately check for a right ventricular infarction, what we're going to do when we see elevation in leads two, three, and AVF, we are going to take V4, okay, and I'm fine with you only moving V4. You're going to move V4 from the left side over to the right side in the same area, okay, that fourth intercostal space underneath the right nipple, and you're going to rerun your 12 lead EKG. With your new printout, you are going to you are going to mark V4R. Okay, it does not automatically do it for you like it shows here in this strip. This is just computer generated. Okay, so when you get that new printout, I want you to take a pen and by that V4, you need to write an R and you need to circle it so you know which 12 lead was your normal left sided 12 lead EKG and which 12 lead was your right-sided 12 lead EKG, okay? So we get an inferior wall MI, we move V4 over to the right, we do another 12 lead. As it prints out, we mark V4, R, that is my right-sided 12 lead EKG. What I am looking at is do I have elevation in V4, R, okay? If I have elevation in V4R, that is telling me this patient is also having a right ventricular infarct, okay? When I, when I say you can just move V4 over to the right side, that has about a 97% accuracy rate, okay? So uh, it is 97% correct. Uh, I'll, I'll take those odds any day. So move V4 over to the right side, if I have elevation in V4, which I do have elevation in V4 in this picture, see if how straight of the line I can draw, not very. I do have elevation in V4R in this 12 lead EKG. So not only do I have an inferior wall in my, because of my elevation, <coughs> but I also have a right ventricular infarction. Why is that important? So what is our treatment plan for patient, for cardiac patients having a STEMI, right? MONA, if you've heard that, that acronym. Not necessarily in that order, right? We give oxygen, we give aspirin, we give nitro. If we need to control their pain, um, then we can give morphine or we can give fentanyl. It, it you know, depends on how you're taught the program and you're in the, the, the fire department you work for, whatever. But the problem is we can give oxygen, we can give aspirin, okay? The problem comes with nitro. So if this person's having a right ventricular infarct and we end up giving them nitroglycerin, we are going to vasodilate, okay? Remember, nitroglycerin, it turns into to, um, nitrous oxide in your blood and it ends up vasodilating, okay? So as I vasodilate, I am going to drop the preload in that patient and that right ventricle is gonna have even a more difficult time pumping blood than what it was, okay? It's already infarcting. It's already having a hard time doing its job because it's got decreased perfusion to it. Well, now what we've done is we've taken that right ventricle that was already failing and already struggling, and we've given this patient nitro, and now their pressure that or, and their vessel that was this diameter that was already struggling, now we've made it this diameter. We've vasodilated that patient, and we've dropped their preload. So now the right, the right ventricle has practically no chance of pumping blood into the lungs and getting it to the left side for perfusion, okay? So remember that inferior wall of my, we need to do a right-sided 12 lead EKG. Look at V4R, okay? <clears throat> if it's elevated, that patient's having a right ventricular infarction. We need to certainly... Um, be cautious with nitro, depending on blood pressure, depending on protocol, you can still give it. I'm really not going to dive into that tonight, um, but, but I certainly wouldn't just go and give them nitro without making sure I'm following my protocol, their blood pressure is adequate enough to support it and so forth. If V4R comes back and it is not elevated, treat them as you would any other cardiac patient. Give them nitro, okay? They're not having a right ventricular infarction if V4R does not come back elevated. Give them nitro. Okay, just as you would with any other type of MI patient. Adam? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.
All right, guys, so we're going to go ahead and jump directly into some of the imitators. Brandon did a great job as far as the anatomy and physiology that is with regards to the coronary vessels um, and then how to look at the J point and compare. So we need to also talk tonight about some of the different things that can imitate um, or make you think that the patient is in fact having a STEMI or an infarction pattern when in reality they may or may not be. Um, and some of those that we'll talk about tonight are bundle branch blocks, both left and right bundle branch, uh, ventricular beats, uh, LVH, which is also known as left ventricular hypertrophy, pericarditis, early repolarization, and a few others. The ones that typically um, kind of jump out at you are for, from a national registry standpoint um, are the bundle branch blocks, ventricular beats, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. I don't think that they're going to throw any curveballs at you as far as pericarditis or early repolarization, uh, but we'll certainly talk about what those are. So with bundle branch blocks, um, where you're going to end up looking for your bundle branch block when you're looking at your EKG, and Brandon said that he generally reads the EKG from left to right, and I do too. Um, in fact, I read it the exact same way that Brandon does as far as looking at one and then going to ABL and then V5 and V6 because at that point, now I have covered all of my lateral leads. Uh, a few things that I think that we should do, and Brandon and I agree on this, prior to even going to lead one though, we should probably take a quick look in V1. So V1, if you can remember, will never lie to you. So what you are actually seeing in V1 is an accurate depiction of what is actually going on in your patient as far as the EKG is concerned. So when you do your 12 lead EKG, we're gonna to go to V1 first and we'll practice this. We go to V1 and we find our J point. Let me, I don't have a touch screen, so I actually have to kind of draw and click on some things here. So when I go to my J point, which for me here, I'm gonna draw this little circle. Here is my J point. What you need to do after you have located the J point is we are actually gonna go backwards. We're gonna go backwards one small block or 0.04 seconds. And when we go back that one small block or 0.04 seconds, I'm sorry, we are gonna look at the terminal deflection and see which direction it is headed. So if I go back and look at this terminal deflection, you can see that the terminal deflection in this particular scenario is going up. So then we relate to what is called the turn signal theory. And some of you may be familiar with this, maybe your instructors have talked to you about it. But if you can envision that you're in a car and you are driving and you are getting ready to turn, you have to hit your turn signal. If you hit your turn signal and you push it up, Hopefully you are making a right-handed turn. If you are driving your vehicle and you press your turn signal down, you are likely making a left-handed turn. And it's the same thing when we talk about bundle branch blocks. So we go to V1, we find the J point, you back up one small block, and you determine which way the terminal deflection or the electrical impulse is headed. If it's going up as it is in this particular situation. If I'm driving and I put my turn signal up, I am making a right-handed turn. So this would be a right bundle branch block. If I am driving my car, I find my J point here. I back up 0.04. I can see that the terminal deflection is heading down. When I'm in my car and I press that turn signal down, I am making a left-handed turn. So that gives me, in this situation, a left bundle branch block. A few things to keep in, in mind and that are important. You notice that both the right and left bundle branch block are both located in V1. And you notice that you find the J point exactly as Brandon described to you before. So if you can just simply remember to look in V1 first, find your J point, back up one small block, and look to see which way it's headed, I think that it'll help you tremendously as far as the right and left bundle branch block. Now, 
what is the inclusive criteria in order for us to even call it a bundle branch block? You have to have a wide QRS. So if you go to lead V1 and you look and your QRS is within normal limits, meaning less than 0.12 seconds in duration, you do not have a bundle branch block. The only time that we have to find that J point and determine if it is a left or a right bundle branch block is when we go to V1 and we look and our QRS is greater than 0.12. So if you look and you have a wide complex in V1, that is when you should start thinking that it's a bundle branch block. Now, one final thing here as far as the bundle branch blocks are concerned. A right bundle branch block, you can still read your EKG appropriately. So you're riding into the hospital, you do an EKG, and you've determined that the patient has a right bundle branch block you can still interpret the underlying 12 lead EKG and call that into the hospital or send it in through an electronic mechanism if you have that ability. If you are doing a 12 lead EKG and the patient is having a left bundle branch block, that is a true imitator of an infarction and you cannot read that EKG as far as a STEMI is concerned. So what I would do is call into your base physician or however you guys normally do that in your normal practice and say, hey, you know, I'm coming in, I have a patient this age, we've done a 12 lead, and they have a left bundle branch block. And that will alert the, the physician um, at the receiving hospital that you've done your job, you've done the EKG, but you're just simply not able to read that, that information at this point because of that left bundle branch block. So bundle branch blocks may produce ST elevation, ST depression, they can give you tall T waves, inverted T waves, wide QRS, or I'm sorry, wide Q waves uh, that Brandon talked about as far as a pathologic Q wave telling you that the patient potentially had a previous infarct. They may also hide ST elevation, depression, those T wave issues, and then that wide QRS as well. So you can see with bundle branch blocks, it's really all over the board. But if they have a right bundle branch block, you can still read the EKG, a left you cannot. Is there anything you want to add to that, Brandon? Nope. Okay. Sorry. All right. So with ventricular rhythms, uh, we talk about paced rhythms, idioventricular, ventricular tachycardia. PVCs, and you guys know that if you have a couple of PVCs in a row, that, that turns into VTAC. Um, and these also can mask or mimic every ECG change suggestive of an acute coronary syndrome. So when you look at this EKG in particular, based on what we just talked about, I'm going to look and lead V1, and hopefully you guys can see that it ends up having a pacer spike. So the pacer spike that I have on this particular EKG as far as V1 is telling me that it is a paced ventricular rhythm. I don't see that it has a pacemaker prior to the atria firing um, as far as P waves are concerned. So this is a paced ventricular rhythm. And again, all bets are off. So as far as the interpretation, this would just be interpreted as a paced ventricular rhythm. Um, and as you call into your hospital or send your EKG in, to let them know that you're transporting a patient to them. Um, I would just let them know that as such, that you're transporting a patient and you've done your 12 lead EKG and it's showing a paced rhythm. So basically what that is gonna do is tell the physician that you're not sure if the patient is in fact having a STEMI or not because uh, there is a mimicker on the EKG. Now, for several years actually, when I was new and had gone through training, um, I was always told that you can't read the EKG I do want to kind of give a little disclaimer. You can. There is a criteria out there that allows you to read past that information, but it is very complex. I do not know paramedics that do that. And in fact, I have challenged and asked several ER physicians, um, and they're familiar with the criteria to be able to do that. However, most of them end up using an application on their, on their cell phone or contacting cardiology to have them read past it. So it is possible to read if they have one of these imitators, we just don't do it at the paramedic level. All right, so what is this? Um, and I know that most of you guys are muted and, and not necessarily interacting at this point, um, and that, 
hopefully we can get that to change here in a few minutes when we get into some of the practice strips. But when you look at this, you can look and, and very quickly determine that there is obviously something that looks a little funky with this particular EKG. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, okay, well, I remember this from class or I had a 12 lead EKG course uh, years ago and I kind of remember this information and you're thinking that it's left ventricular hypertrophy, you are absolutely correct. So remember that LVH, much like a bundle branch block, either left or right, or much like the ventricular rhythms, like ventricular tachycardia or paced ventricular rhythms, um, it will mimic what a STEMI looks like. So if you're not paying attention as far as the LVH and these other mimickers, you're gonna probably end up calling this um, an anterior septal wall MI, um, in which case that would not be correct. So we look at lead V1, um, and that measures less than 0.12. So we don't think that we end up having a bundle branch block. So then we would go through and we would look at our other criteria here as far as 1, AVL, V5, and V6, 2, 3, and AVF, V1 and V2, and then V3 and V4 as far as rating your normal 12 lead EKG. As far as LVH, the criteria is this. You look at lead V1 and V2, and you pick the lead that has the most negative deflection. So when we're talking about the most negative deflection, what I mean is from this point to the bottom, and it's kind of overlapped down here in V3, but you can appreciate, I'm just gonna kind of draw this in a little bit to kind of give you an idea. Um, so here is the most negative deflection, and we're looking to determine between V1 and V2, which one has the deeper negative deflection. And you can tell that that's obviously gonna be V2. It's much deeper, and like I said, it overlaps in V3, so it's a little bit hard to count it for sure. But what we would need to do is we need to count these boxes up. So if you can just recall that as we're going down, each one of these big blocks is five millimeters. So as we continue to go down, and again, I'm gonna to have to kind of guess a little bit here, we're gonna end up just counting this down. So I've got five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And as an example, we'll call the negative deflection on this EKG 30. The second step that we're gonna end up doing is we go to V5 and V6, and we look to see which one has the most positive deflection. And we do the same thing. And I think that we can agree that between V5 and V6, V5 has the highest positive deflection. So if I started there and I ended there, I'm gonna count these boxes in between five, 10, 15, we'll call it 16. So if I had 30 over here and I had 16 over here, the total there would end up becoming 36. And that would actually meet the criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, and I'll show you why. Let me clear this off. So what we do, as I mentioned, we look in V1 and V2, we pick the negative, or the, the deepest negative deflection, and count it up and then remember that number. Then you go to V5 and V6, you find the most positive deflection, you count it up and remember that number, and you add the two numbers together. If the sum of those two numbers when added together, so for example, 30 and 16 would end up becoming 46, um, that is obviously more than 35, so that patient would be suspected of having left ventricular hypertrophy. Again, that is a true mimicker. Call into the hospital, tell the doc, Hey, we're bringing a patient in that has LVH, um, therefore I can't tell you what's going on as far as their 12 lead EKG is concerned. And again, this is just another picture of the same EKG that we just talked about uh, with LVH. Um, every one of your LVH EKGs that you guys will run into, they will look very characteristic of this. You should be able to look at a patient that has LVH on 12 lead EKG and pick that out very quickly. They will all have these very long um, negative deflections, and then oftentimes they will have much taller positive deflections. But again, when you add those two numbers up, 
uh, it should equate to being over 35. And if it does, then the patient is known to have left ventricular hypertrophy. What causes LVH? Um, it's hypertension. So chronic hypertension, the left ventricle is having to work hard to pump blood out from the left ventricle through systemic circulation. And because of that, uh, the left ventricle becomes enlarged, hence the hypertrophy. Uh, so it changes the electrical impulse because of that enlarged heart. As far as the left ventricle, not necessarily an enlarged heart uh, systemically. <coughs> Excuse me. Some medications, uh, hypothermia and WPW concerns that we think are important for you guys to know when you're looking at an EKG. On the far left is something called a digitalis effect. So what DIG is, is a cardiac glycoside, um, and it is used to basically strengthen the contraction for a patient that has atrial fib. They also use them in patients that have congestive heart failure, et cetera. Uh, so what you'll end up getting there is something called a SAG characteristic sag and you can see it's in red um, and it's basically because of the repolarization of the ventricles and if you kind of think back a p wave is depolarization of the atria it repolarizes somewhere in the qrs complex the qrs is depolarization of the ventricle and then it has to repolarize so it is ready to fire again so it kind of um, it, it deals with the ventricles trying to repolarize, and that is why that characteristic sag. A lot of times you'll hear people talk that it'll end up being flattened um, or notched, and that is known as a digitalis effect. So the patient is on dig and they're therapeutic. The one in the middle is called a delta wave, um, and that is found in a patient that has Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. And what actually happens here? Um, you end up with what's called a delta wave. So if you look there, you find your isoelectric line, you find your P wave. That P wave, that PR interval should come all the way over to where the dotted line is and then go up making it an R wave. There would not be a Q in this particular example. What happens though in a patient that has Wolf Parkinson White is because of the re-entry pathways, the electrical impulse can get from the SA node down to the ventricles quicker than it should. Um, and it's, it's done through those accessory pathways. So that accessory pathway allows the firing of the ventricle to happen prematurely. And that's where that delta wave comes in. Um, and again, you can see there from the depiction that it comes over um, as a delta wave. And then the third one here is, um, is shown as hypothermia, and that's known as an Osborne wave or a J wave. Um, they don't really know what causes this. There are other things other than hypothermia, patients that have hypocalcemia, uh, head injured patients can sometimes uh, present with an Osborne wave or a J wave, um, but it, it's really unknown as to what causes it and where it comes from, unlike the delta wave and the dig effect. Uh, where they know where, where it's actually coming from and the cause for that. The Osborne wave doesn't have a real known cause, uh, but that's what it looks like. And some people will say it's kind of like a camelback or a humpback, um, but it's always going to be on the right side um, of your QRS complex. So Brandon and I have talked about this a lot in, in my paramedic class. You know, I talk to, to our students and kind of tell them, I don't think that you guys, if you're looking to take the National Registry, you have not yet taken the examination, I don't think that they will give you a delta wave and ask you to interpret it. What I think that they will do though, is they will tell you that you have a patient that has a delta wave and they wanna know what causes that. Um, and the answer in that situation would be Wolf Parkinson White. Same thing with an Osborne wave or a J wave, that would be hypothermia. So be familiar with what the waves look like and what they mean, uh, more so than being able to pick them out in an EKG. All right, so let's practice a few of these. Brandon, can you, how many do we have on? Uh, I think we only have eight okay. out of the 25 that joined us. So right. find out. So it, by all means, we can definitely open them all up. Okay, so what I'd like to do is take a second to interpret uh, one or two of these EKGs and then kind of turn it over and walk through it with you guys. If you want to do that uh, with, with having a smaller group, I think that we're able to do that and still kind of come in under our time. 
Um, if you guys don't necessarily want to have to interpret them um, in a group setting, that's okay too. Um, and some of you may not have the ability to have audio. We may not be able to hear you, but um, what we can do is we'll time it and give everybody a minute or so to do your own interpretation of the EKG, and then I'll go through and interpret it at the end so that you guys can see, you know, if you're on the right path or you are not. So, yeah, yeah I think, I think uh, if someone wants it, you jump in. Well, we'll just, we'll just give everyone 30 to 60 seconds to kind of look at it, make your interpretation. And then before Adam goes through with what he sees, if somebody wants to jump in and say, hey, this is, you know, you can unmute yourself. Hey, this is what I see. Um, uh, I think that'll be a good way to go through to give everyone an opportunity to jump in and, and, and do an interpretation, but also not to force anyone's hand in it either. Yeah, that, that's fine, Brandon. So for this first one, I'm gonna do the first one just to kind of show you again, the formatting of how Brandon and I both approach these EKGs. Um, and then starting with the next one or number two, again, like Brandon said, feel free to jump in. If not, then we'll time it. We'll give everybody a minute or so to interpret each one of the EKGs that we have. Um, and then I'll go through it at the end of that minute so that you can tell if you're on the right path or not. So in this situation here, we're going to look at lead V1. And when I'm looking in lead V1, all I am looking for is to see if the patient uh, or if that EKG is wide or narrow. And you can see that in this particular situation, it is narrow, it is less than 0.12. So we do not have to worry about this patient having a bundle branch block. Then I'm gonna come over and I'm looking at lead one. I'm finding the J point. I'm looking at that as compared to the um, ST, or I'm sorry, the, yeah, the, the TP segment of the next complex. Um, I don't have elevation in one. I'm looking in AVL. I have no elevation in AVL. I'm looking in lead V5. I don't, I may have a little bit of elevation in, in V5, but I don't necessarily think so. And then I look at V6. And again, I don't think that I have a millimeter of elevation in V5 or V6. I go to lead two. I find my J point, I compare that to the TP segment, it looks even to me. I go to lead three, I find my J point, I compare it to the TP segment, it looks normal to me. And I go to AVF, I find my J point, I compare it to the TP segment, and it looks normal to me. The next lead that I would go to is lead V1, which was kind of where we started to see if it was wide or narrow. I find my J point, I compare it to the TP, that is equal. I go to lead V2, I find my J point, I compare that to the TP, that is equal. I go to V3, here's my J point, compare it to a TP, it is normal. I go to lead V4, I find my J point, and I compare that to my TP segment. And you can see it may be a little bit higher there, but it is not a full millimeter. And remember Brandon told you in order to call it an elevation, it has to be one small block or bigger, and it has to be in two either anatomically contiguous or numerically consecutive. So this particular EKG that we're looking at here, I do not have any elevation there. I would call that a normal finding on my 12 lead EKG. So this is just the answer to 12 lead number one, the interpretation, sinus tachycardia, which we didn't count the rate in particular, uh, but otherwise it is a normal ECG. There is no elevation there. There's no significant T wave changes or anything else that we need to be concerned with. All right, so looking at this one, this is actually a really good EKG because it's very clean and very crisp. So if you are truly new, at reading 12 lead EKGs, this is a very good EKG to practice with. And again, if anybody wants to shout out and, and take, take control of this one, that's fine. If you wanna do it on your own, that's fine too. We'll give you about a minute or so.
All right, so if we start in lead V1, I can look in lead V1 and determine that that is not wider than 0.12. So I don't think that I have to worry about it being a bundle branch block. So then I'm gonna go to V, I'm sorry, lead one. Um, and Brandon, feel free to argue with me or, or tell me what you normally do, but when for the group, when I was taught to read EKGs, I was always told to move over one if you have the ability to do that. Um, so, yeah. for instance, let, let, let's look at ABF real quick. If you're looking at ABF and it's really close to the ABF, that's actually uh, potential that it's still in transition. So that, that particular beat might be a little funky and it may give you some false information. So if you can, try to move over one beat before you actually look at your EKG. No, that's absolutely correct. And I'm glad, I'm glad you... Uh, remember to mention that today. Yeah, no, that's I, I always look at the second or third beat. If your second and third beats are kind of crappy looking, there's a lot of artifact or moving up or down on the paper, and that first beat is the the best beat you have in that. Then sure, use it. Um, but it, if you if you have a good beat in the, that second or third beat that you're seeing there in that two and a half second window of time that these leads show us, then by all means, I would I would certainly recommend using that second or third beat and staying away from that first one uh, in in the in the lead. All right, so we've looked at V1. We don't think we have a bundle branch block, so I'm gonna find my J point. Um, and my J point is compared to the TP, is isoelectric or even, so there's no elevation. That's a good thing. On the next one, AVL, I find my J point. I compare it to the TP, it looks equal. In V5, I end up finding my J point. I compare it to the TP. Isoelectric, J point in V6 to the TP segment is isoelectric. In lead two, J point, TP, isoelectric. Three, J point, isoelectric. AVF, I have my J point, and that is also isoelectric. Let's go to V1. V1, I find my J point. TP, it's even. B2, I find my J point. I compare it to the TP, it is even. B3, J point, isoelectric, that is even. And then B4, I find my J point. I compare it to my TP segment, it is even. Now, y'all are probably wondering, why are these guys giving us all these normal EKGs? So it's important to remember that you are going to do a lot of EKGs in practice and you're going to find a lot of your EKGs are completely normal. Um, it is important to do them if they're having complaints. Elderly, female, diabetic, chronic hypertensive patients, they don't present typically. So if they tell you that they have a problem, you should really be doing a 12 lead EKG. In addition to that, if you are a paramedic student, um, as faculty, we sometimes like to throw curveballs at you. Um, I'll give my students a normal EKG just to build their confidence because I want them to be able to look at that and go, that is normal, there is nothing there. So just because you're in a 12 lead class or you're in paramedic school doesn't mean that you have to find something on the EKG. Yeah, in the, in, the, in the same sense that just because you're sitting at a static or dynamic cardiology station doesn't mean there's something wrong with that strip or there's something wrong with the patient. Don't, don't let your mind take you down this pathway of, oh, they're giving me this 12 lead on an exam or, I'm sitting in the dynamic cardiology station and they have a strip in front of me. I have to treat it, right? So don't, don't forget about normal. Correct. And then this is just the answer to the second 12 lead that we just looked at. There's really no artifact or anything underlying. It was a beautiful EKG. It's a sinus rhythm. There's no ST elevation. There's nothing funky with the T wave. So it is just a straightforward uh, 12 lead EKG. Looking at the next one, again, we'll give you a minute here to interpret it, kind of go through.
Sorry, you guys. All right, so looking in V1, again, it's narrow, so we don't have a bundle branch block that we're concerned with. I end up going to lead V, I'm sorry, lead one. I keep saying V1 and I apologize for that. I go to one, I find my J point, it is even. I go to ABL, I find my J point, it is even. I go to V5, I find my J point, it is even. V6, J point is also even. I go to two, find J, it's even with my TP. I go to lead three, I find my J point, it is even. I go to ABF, I find my J point, and it is even. I go to V1, I find my J point, it is even, although I do have a flip T wave in V1. I go to V2, I find my J point, it is even. I go to V3, J point, it is even. V4, I find my J point, and it is also even. Now, one thing looking at this EKG, I don't have a STEMI. I feel confident saying, yeah, I don't see anything as far as STEMI is concerned, not that they're not having an infarction uh, such as a non-STEMI. Uh, but looking at this EKG, you can see that there are some irregularities to it. So when you look at the base uh, EKG as far as like lead two, if that's what you're normally monitoring in, you're probably going to pick up on the fact that this is in atrial fibrillation. So um, there, there appears to be some P waves, but I don't know that they're necessarily great. Uh, they're definitely not consistent, but from a 12 lead perspective, there is nothing on this 12 lead EKG. Uh, that would make me be concerned to call into the hospital and tell them, hey, we're bringing this particular patient in. So it's atrial fib, nonspecific ST and T wave changes, um, and that's the flip T waves that we're talking about. So V1, V2, and V3, I'm going backwards, so these, this is the same EKG. You can see that V1 has flipped, V2 has flipped, and V3 has flipped T waves. Um, so for all intents and purposes, that is an ischemic finding until proven otherwise, uh, and the patient should be evaluated, but there is not an actual injury pattern on this EKG. All right, number four. Give you guys about 30 seconds or so to interpret this one. We'll try to pick up the pace a little bit for you. All right, so starting in V1, Phil. Does anyone, does anyone want to take a stab at it? Philip S. raised his hand, Brandon. So All right. I don't know if that means he wants to take a stab or maybe he has a question we should probably ask him. Either way, I feel like he's about to be put on the spot. All right, so Phil, let me uh, find you here in the list. Adam will unmute you. Okay, Philip, you should have the ability to talk. Can you hear me? We yep. can. How are you? I'm well. Yourself? Good. Thanks for joining us. For sure. Thanks for having me. Did, um, you, did you have a question or did you want to try this one? 
Um, I was going to try it. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Um, so um, looking in, you know, starting in uh, lead one, um, there's a lot of artifact in it. Right. But, uh, it looks, um, you know, from the J point, I can kind of make out. It looks like it just slightly. Um, going over from there, uh, ABL, though, okay. that doesn't appear to be any. Um, when I move down to lead two, uh, there is, there, a, from the J point, I kind of make out from the artifact, it appears to be slightly elevated. Are you, so um, you're lead two at this point? Uh, yes. All right. So if you're comfortable reading these, do it with your way. I don't want to turn you against that. If mm -hmm. you are new to reading these, I would recommend that since you have started with one in AVL, mm -hmm. I would go ahead and look at V5 and V6. Gotcha. Then we have looked at all of our lateral leads. Yeah. Gotcha. I see. That okay. makes sense. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so if we go to V5, yep. um, then if we find that J point, um, it's definitely uh, elevated. I agree. If we go straight across. Yes. Okay. And uh, when we go to V6, uh, is also elevated as well. So right right now, Philip, just without looking at anything else, at a minimum, what do you have thus far? Uh, a lateral uh, infarct or a lateral injury. Good. We have ST segment elevation greater than one millimeter and at least two anatomically contiguous leads, right? V5 and V6, my, my two lateral leads on my right side. Good. All right. Continue on there. All right. So, uh, so if we go to lead two, um, you know, it looks like there's some slight elevation there, uh, even in that artifact there. Okay. Um, V3 doesn't appear to have uh, as much elevation. And ABF also looks to be, um, you know, even there. Okay. Um, then we move to V1. Um, that J point, the... Uh, Pretty even, I would say. I agree. Um, but once we get to V2, um, I would definitely say elevation there. I agree. Um, V3, elevation for sure, um, as well as V4. Very good. So we have elevation in two, three, four, five, and six. What do you um, think that is? So, um, would that that be a qualifier for the uh, for the widowmaker? The uh, with the uh, the fact that it reaches all four of those, or at least four consecutive. Okay. Very good. Yep. So that the way that that would be termed, if you're calling this in, would be an extensive anterior MI. So we have elevation or an infarction in our lateral, our anterior, and our septal leads. So it is basically wiping out the entire left side. That left main coronary artery is occluded proximally. So you have a very high occlusion, which is now causing a blockage and diminished blood flow to the anterior wall, the septal yeah. wall, and that lateral wall. So that is very, very good. It's good for you that you interpret it as bad for the patient, I should say. Absolutely. It is terrible for the patient, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> good job. Thank you. So let me ask you a question for the group. Um, let's just say for argument's sake that we do have a little bit of elevation in lead two. Because you kind of were saying, ah, maybe it's a little elevated, but when you got to three, it was not. And when you got to ABF, it was not. So if that's the case, does lead two really even mean anything? Uh, um, if I would say no, okay. since, uh, since uh, you know, if it was, again, just being slightly, and since it's not you know, consecutive, so it's not in three and it's not in ABF, um, you know, yeah. So, yeah, it would have to be more than a millimeter, and if it was elevated in two, it would also need to be elevated in three and ABF or ABF in order to be called a STEMI because you would have to have it in two or more. So, very good on that. Good job. Thank you. All right, so let's look and see if we got it right. Yep, the interpretation is an extensive anterior infarction. You have elevation in V2 through V6. That is very, very good. All right, let's take a look at the next one. If anybody else wants to join, go ahead and 
raise your hand or unmute yourself. And if nobody does, Philip, and you want to take the next one, that's fine too. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this. So we'll start in V1. Does anyone else want to take a say about it? You don't see anything, Brandon? Nope. All right. So looking in V1, it's narrow. So we don't have a bundle branch block that we're dealing with. I go to lead one. I find my J point. It's isoelectric, even though there is a little bit of artifact. And I wish I had a perfect way to tell you guys how to get around that. That is simply just an experience thing. So if you're looking in lead one, you can see that it's kind of running away from you a little bit to the right. Um, you're just going to have to learn how to read through some of that stuff and experience will allow you to be able to do that. But I don't see anything that's worth, worth uh, calling in for. I go to AVL. I definitely have flipped T waves in AVL, which tells me that I probably have a little bit of ischemia. I go to V5, it is normal. I go to V6, it is normal. I look at lead two, it appears to me that I have maybe a little bit of elevation there, but again, it's kind of running away from me, making it a little bit difficult um, to, to tell if there's elevation or not. So let's look at the other two that are in that grouping. If I go to lead three and find my J point, I think I definitely have some elevation in lead three. And then I look at AVF. When I find my J point in AVF, I think that I definitely have a millimeter of elevation in AVF as well. I go to V1, I have flip T waves. V2, I have a flip T wave. V3 appears to me to be isoelectric. V4 is isoelectric. And we've already looked at V5 and V6 when we were looking at our lateral grouping. So what I would call this NAS, is an inferior wall MI with reciprocal changes. Um, and you really have reciprocal changes kind of all over the place. You have them in AVL, you have them in your septal leads. Um, so uh, flip T waves are reciprocal changes in my lateral and septal leads. Uh, but this is an inferior wall MI. And to just kind of put it on your radar, Brandon I did already talk about this. If I have an inferior wall MI, I should be thinking of doing what? And I'll give you a second to answer your own question or answer my question. What should you be considering doing for this patient? If you're saying that you should be doing a right-sided EKG, you are absolutely correct. Remember these patients, if they have elevation in V4R, we do not want to use nitrates right away. We need to make sure that the tank is full. So we have to give them fluids. So we would simply move that V4R over, redo our 12 lead EKG, and if I have elevation in V4R, then I would be thinking about giving fluids and not nitrates. If it is not elevated in V4R, then you can proceed with your typical MONA as long as they meet all the other criteria. So the interpretation here, an inferior infarction, and I should be doing a right-sided EKG to determine if there is right-sided involvement or not. All right, looking at the next one, I go to V1, and as you can tell here, V1 looks to be a little funky. It looks wider than the other EKGs that we have been looking at. So let me get my tool here to draw. If I find, the beginning of my QRS complex, which I'm gonna say is right here. And I find the end of that QRS complex, which is right here. If I measure that out, that is gonna be greater than 0.12 seconds in nature. So then what I need to do is I need to find my J point and back up 0.04. When I back up one small block, you can tell that the terminal deflection is facing down. 
So remember, you're driving your car, you push your turn signal down, hopefully you are turning left. And remember that what we talked about before with a left bundle branch block, that is a true imitator of your EKG, meaning that you're no longer able to read this as a STEMI or a non-STEMI. Um, basically, you would just call in, hey, I've got a patient with a left bundle branch block, and hopefully the hospital will have an old EKG that they can refer to. Other than that, you're not able to read this EKG. So you can see that starting in V1 has saved me a lot of time because I'm not necessarily going to go through and read one AVL, V5, and V6, two, three, and AVF because I already know with the left bundle branch block, I'm not able to interpret that EKG anyway. So the interpretation, this is a left bundle branch block. Here's the next one. I look in V1, it appears narrow or less than 0.12. So I'm gonna just read it as normal. I go to my lead one, J point is depressed below, so it's underneath the isoelectric line, so that tells me that I have some ischemia there. AVL is obviously depressed. V5, and this is an important thing here. So when we talked about transitioning that lead, if you look at the very first beat in V5, it looks kind of funky as compared to the next two. I think that's just part of that transition. So if I'm in V5, the second beat, it looks pretty normal. V6, the second beat, it looks pretty normal. I go to two, I have elevation. Three, I have elevation. AVF, I have elevation. So I know that I have an inferior wall MI at this point. I go to V1. Again, there's some artifact here, but I can still appreciate that there is a flipped T wave. I go to V2, I have a flipped T wave. I go to V3, I have a flip T wave, and I go to V4, I also have a flip T wave. Now, one thing that we haven't really hammered on, and I don't know that we're going to in depth tonight, uh, but this is an inferior wall infarction. And another thing that you guys can kind of keep in mind is if you have ST segment depression or flip T waves in V1 through V4, you need to think that it could end up being that the patient also has a posterior wall MI. Um, so we don't touch on that a lot um, as far as this particular course, but you may need to end up taking leads off and wrapping them around the back and doing a seven, eight, and nine. So if this was just truly a straightforward um, inferior wall MI, hopefully you guys are thinking to move that V4R over redo your 12 lead to see if there's elevation or not. Remember, if there is elevation in V4R, then fluids is the treatment and withhold your nitro. If it is not elevated in V4R, then nitroglycerin would be appropriate as long as their pressure will allow for it. So the interpretation, an inferior infarct, possible posterior wall, and that's because you have that depression in V1 through V4. All right, V1, narrow, one, isoelectric, maybe a flip T wave, AVL, flip Ts. V5, that actually looks, it's kind of funky looking, but I think there's some elevation there in V5. V6 looks isoelectric. Lead two, looks normal, lead three looks normal, AVF looks normal. So then I go to V1, V1 looks normal to me, lead two looks elevated. If I find that J point and drew a line over, it's gonna be above the, the TP segment. So I have elevation in V2, I have elevation in V3, I have elevation in V4, and I've already called elevation in V5. So much like Philip was just talking about, if I have elevation in V2, 3, 4, and 5, that tells me that I have an extensive anterior MI, uh, and I have a proximal occlusion of the left main coronary artery. V6. 
do a few more of these. We got a few more minutes here. Looking at this one, um, it, the QRS segment in V1, it looks wide, but if you actually take the time to measure that out, it is less than 0.12 seconds. It's probably right on the money as far as 0.08. Um, so it's not a bundle branch block. I've got maybe a little ST depression um, in lead one, maybe a little bit of depression in AVL, V5, maybe a little depression, and V6, maybe a little bit of a depression. So I think I probably have some ischemia going on here for sure. I get to lead two. Um, lead two actually looks okay. Lead three, when I find my J point, I have elevation in lead three, and I have elevation in ABF. So I have elevation in two, or I'm sorry, three in ABF, telling me that I have an inferior wall MI. Lead V1 appears to be isoelectric. V2 is isoelectric. V3 is isoelectric. And V4 is isoelectric. So it's an inferior wall MI. This one's a little bit more difficult um, as far as trying to figure out where that TP segment is. There is some elevation there. Remember that this is going to end up being um, a right sided 12 lead that needs to happen. I have a narrow V1, depression in one, depression in ABL, isoelectric in V5 and V6. I have elevation in two, three, and ABF. Lead V1 is isoelectric. V2, there is actually some depression there from your J point to your TP. V3 um, appears to be isoelectric. And V4 uh, appears to be close to isoelectric as well. Um, so I have an inferior wall MI, lead 2, 3, and AVF. And I have some reciprocal changes as far as those flip T waves and my lateral leads for sure. Um, notice there on V4, V5, and V6 that PVC. So in addition to the patient having an inferior wall MI, they're also having premature ventricular contractions. And that's why that looks funky. Again, as we mentioned before, just kind of move over a beat and then do your interpretation. So it's an inferior infarct, do the right side of 12 lead that we've been talking about. All right, just a couple more here. Um, V1 is narrow. There is a, quite a bit of artifact in this particular EKG, but one is uh, isoelectric. AVL is isoelectric. V5, there is depression. V6, there is depression. So I definitely have some ischemia in my lateral leads. Two, looks normal. Three, I don't see any elevation. ABF, I don't see any elevation. V1, um, it looks like there might be a little bit of elevation in V1. I think there definitely is in V2. V3 appears to be elevated to me and V4 actually looks to be a little bit depressed. So I have elevation in V1 and V2. Remember that those go together anatomically and they touch each other numerically. So I have a septal wall infarction. When I add V3 into that, it also brings in my anterior wall. So this is an anterior septal and your treatment modality here is gonna be a Mona. I'll do one more, Brandon, and then take some time for questions if they have. Yeah, let's, let's just knock this one out, and then we'll okay. see if they have any questions. Those are still hanging in there. Okay. So V1, narrow, one, depression. AVL, flip T, so hypoxia or ischemia. V5 is flipped. V6 is flipped. So we know this, this patient definitely needs to be on some oxygen. I look at lead two. Um, I have maybe a little bit of elevation if I'm comparing the J to the TP, but I definitely have it in three and I definitely have it in ABF. So I know this is an inferior wall infarction. Uh, V1, I have flipped T waves. V2, I have depression with flipped T waves. 
V3, I have depression with flip T waves. V4, depression, flip T waves. So this is a very irritable heart. This patient is in fact having an inferior wall MI um, and they have basically reciprocal changes in all of their other leads. So what do you do? Move V4R over, reprint your EKG to see if you have elevation or not, and then make your determination on whether or not Mona or fluids is the appropriate treatment. All right, so just for the sake of time and getting you guys out um, on time, there are three more EKGs, but if you guys are okay with it, we'll kind of open it up to questions that any of you may have. You can unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself, uh, or if you want to send it in the chat, either one's completely fine. Or if you don't have any questions, that's fine too. If there are no questions, I'm totally happy to go ahead and interpret the, the next three EKGs. It'll only take a minute to do it. I don't want to shortchange it, but I wanted to make sure that we respected your time and had an opportunity for you to ask questions if you needed to. I'm down with that. Okay, thanks, Philip. All right. I'll go ahead and just knock these next three out. And if you guys have questions, just raise your hand or unmute yourself. All right, so V1, narrow. So it's not a bundle branch. I look at one, it's isoelectric. AVL is definitely flipped. V5 is isoelectric. V6 is isoelectric. Two is elevated. Three is elevated. AVF is elevated, so I have an inferior wall MI for sure. V1, I have flipped T waves. V2 is flipped. V3 is flipped. V4 is depressed with flipped T. And V5, I have depression. I've already looked at that. And then V6, we've already looked at as well. So in this situation here, I have an inferior wall MI with reciprocal changes in my lateral and my anterior and septal leads. So you basically have widespread reciprocal changes, but the inferior wall MI is what you should be paying attention to. Remember to do that V4R. All right, V1, narrow. I look at one, it's isoelectric. AVL is maybe a little elevated. V5 is isoelectric. V6 is isoelectric. I look at lead two. It appears to be normal. Actually, it appears to be depressed. Uh, three is depression. AVF is depression. V1, I have elevation. V2, I have elevation. V3, I have elevation. V4, I have elevation. What this is here is an anterior septal MI um, because I have elevation in my V1 and V2 and my V3 and V4. Remember that because they touch, um, that is an anterior and septal MI. So both of those are brought into that. Your treatment is gonna be nitrates and oxygen and morphine, so your mono mnemonic. Fifteen, it's a narrow and V1. One is isoelectric. AVL is isoelectric, maybe a little elevated, but probably not enough to call it. V5 is isoelectric. V6 is actually depressed. Two is depressed. Three is depressed. AVF is depressed. V1 is elevated. V2 elevated, V3 elevated, V4 elevated. Much like the one we just looked at, this is an anterior septal MI. 